Welcome to The Truth In This Art, your source for conversations at the intersection of arts, culture, and community. I am your host, Rob Lee. Thanks for listening, sharing, and subscribing. Be sure to check out our Patreon and leave a review on your favorite podcast app. It really helps us grow and to continue this great work. Today, I am honored to be in conversation with a jazz musician, uh, composer, educator, band leader, uh, jazz ambassador for the U.S. Department of State. Please welcome Claudence Louis. Welcome to the podcast. What's going on, Rob, man? Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. Excited to have you here. Excited to be talking to another, you know, another brother, glasses, the whole thing. We out here, you know, <laughs> spectacle. Let's go. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a look. It's a real look. <laughs> yeah, one of the, like you know one of the things my my partner jokes about. She's like, if you keep going down this path of interviewing artists, the glasses are going to get smaller, the scarf's going to get bigger, you're going to get more pretentious. I was like, that's the goal. That's the dream. We can always. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Um, but yeah, um, thank you for for making the time to come on, and I'm I'm definitely excited for this this conversation, and. Um, before we get into it, you know, super deep, I, I want to give you the space to to introduce yourself and dive a bit into your background, your upbringing. Um, and, you know, we, we're going to tease it. We're going to tease it because I got more. I got okay. music questions, but we're going to tease it. Okay. Give us a little bit, <laughs> just a little bit. But, you know, a bit of your background and and things of that nature. OK. Um, yeah. My name is Claudence Louis, um, Haitian-American. So my parents are full throttle Haitians from Paul Point me. And, um, you know, immigrated here. I grew up in Little Haiti, um, which is a community down in Miami where you feel like you literally in the heart of Haiti itself. And um, with that, you know, Miami full of very different types of music. So um, I was surrounded by so many cultures, uh, so much great music, great vibes, great food. And so, you know, that's the Miami way. And, uh, you know, I grew up here and, and I'm super excited about that. I got introduced to the drums uh, when I was about three, started playing some keys when I was about seven, and then got introduced to the saxophone at about age, I want to say 11 or 12. So it's been about 17 years. And um, yeah, man, uh, the rest of that is kind of history, man. You know, just <laughs> loving the music. Jazz itself was brought to me uh, in when I was in about ninth grade, was when I first heard jazz music, I fell in love with the sounds of Dexter Gordon and Coleman Hawkins, yeah. you know, the, the, the guys that really was doing the thing. And um, yeah, from then I started studying, got addicted, couldn't stop. And so here we are, <laughs> uh, 17 years later, I am currently uh, an educator. Uh, I am a performer, performing artist, recording artist, composer, and yeah, man, that's what I do. That's me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh here. And, and and I like that you 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 started touching on it. You, you gave it. You gave a little bit of the the trailer to what this conversation is going to really dive into a bit more. And you know, it, it is one of those things where you're in your sort of uh, your 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 preteens, your early teens, and you're like, all right, what do I want to do creatively? Um, I, I was just revisiting this earlier. Um, if you're a creative person, you might be an athlete and things of that nature. And I, you know, her, you know, you're, you're you know, athletically inclined as well. Um, but it is one of those things that go back to high school and look at freshman year, right? So like 14, you know, and we we had a very um, tough school. People were like, you ain't gonna be here next semester, bro. It was kind of like your brain <laughs> trash. I, mine's weren't. Mine's was great. I was, you know, dope, but they they were not. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. Right. <laughs> and I used to have one of those little handy recorders, like kind of like, um, you know, and I, I would go to, you know, my my peers, you know, speaking to my third person. Like I said, I was going to Miami. I was, I was going to be the rock in Miami. That's what my plan was. <laughs> and, and, you know, I was speaking to third person, but I would have the mic and I would ask them about how the year was almost like mm -hmm. doing an interview super early. Like, you know, that's at this point, 24 years ago. Wow. Yeah, I'm wow. old. <laughs> wow. She, you don't look it, man. And you're not that old, but you don't look it, man. That's why. Appreciate you, bro. Appreciate you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Nice. So I, discovering jazz, I, I want to I touch on that because, um, you know, that's the thing that's of interest for me, right? So 
you know, I, I think I, I heard in one of the interviews, it was maybe, maybe it was the interviewer was mentioning something about Sonny Rollins and that, that became like a conversation point in real life for me. Um, you know, I went to Morgan state university, proud HBCU alum. Right. And, mm. and, um, while I was in, in high school and, and maybe early in college, they would have like, um, you know, 88.9, would, they would have uh jazz music, you know, while Gary Ellaby and all of that good stuff. And, my dad was into it. I was like, man, what's this jazz? I want to some, listen to some hip hop. That's <laughs> trap or whatever, right? And now as an adult, you know, the only records I really have are jazz records. I got like a lot of Charles Fingers records in here. And yeah, 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 yeah. That's the energy. So that discovery for me was like one of those things of you'll get it when you're older. It was kind of that. Ooh. That's what I realized. So for you, what was like sort of that maybe first you know, experience with jazz, the culture, the music that, you know, you, you recognize, not the one you realize like, okay, I'm kind of interested in this, but the one you recognize, you may have like pushed it to the side or maybe you embraced it initially. Well, I think, man, to be honest, I, I didn't embrace it immediately. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Cause it's, it's interesting. I was a huge, I mean, and still am, I'm going to be wrong, like a huge hip hop head. Like, you know, I grew up a lot listening to Wayne, listening to Jeezy, listening to Jada Kiss, and and a whole lot of that music was heavy with me, Pac and Big, and I love listening to this stuff, just the cadence, and love hearing people play with words. Like this was something that I always enjoyed, and so you know, I never heard no jazz music prior to you know my freshman year auditioning for an art school. Mind you, I'm a saxophonist. And I'm coming in that in there like trying to audition. They're like, what do you got to play? I'm playing a cello concerto. I'm reading down this stuff. And they're like, what? <laughs> and then my director at the time, who I didn't know was gonna be my director, but he accepted me in the school. You know, he's like, Do you can you play Autumn Leaves? And I'm like, What's that? <laughs> he's like, What? It's like you a brother, man. You play saxophone, you don't know this. Da, da, da. I'm like, man, I came up on Lionel Richie, Stevie Wonder, hip hop, Celine Dion, like, you know, and Haitian jazz. Like, that's what I knew. I didn't know, I don't know about this. And man, I remember, I remember like it was yesterday, man. That aha moment, like, oh snap, like I really, really love this. And it was like, where has this been all my life? You know what I mean? Was when I heard there was there was two records. It kind of happened all in the same mix. Uh, I had a friend of mine when I was in high school named Abraham Mendez, and he put me on two records. I heard Dexter Gordon playing on Blue Bossa, yeah. and I was like, whoa, why he rapping on the saxophone? Like, he's literally making these rhythm and rhyme these phrases are all interconnected and it's he rhyming on the horn like that's crazy and then i listened to coleman hawkins this Afinatum, that whole album and i was done i was like yo i want to do this because like i need to learn how to rap on this horn and like they freestyle it and improvise and it's the same thing that you do when you're in a cypher and i'm like except it's collective and i was i felt automatically I was like, yo, this is, this is nuts. Where has this been all my life? So that was the moment for me when I heard those two guys. I love that. It's, it's the sort of Rosetta stoning of it, of like, mm. oh, now I understand this in a different way. And you, you crack the code and, you know, but you got to find it on your own or it may, maybe yeah. someone might, might mention it to you, but you got to find it on your own. And once you find sure. it, like now this is my relationship with this form of expression. So yeah. This kind of in a segue way, segue way. That's that's weird. Um, <laughs> segue way. In a segue. Hey. Um, <laughs> talk, talk a bit about your relationship with the saxophone. Like, how would you describe that relationship? Uh, and, and the reason I ask that, you know, like we all have our tool, whatever it is to you know channel our expression. Right. I, I'm using microphones, and I'm very specific about what mm -hmm. I use. Like there are certain gear that I'm like, I don't use that. And I know it's gonna sound different. I know it's gonna be a different thing, but it took time. Like the the stuff that I use, I've been using for like seven years, eight years, that brand and so on. So talk mm -hmm. a bit about that as far as you with sort of the, the discovering that, okay, the saxophone is gonna be my thing and sort of your relationship with it over, as you, you mentioned, these sort of 17 years. Yeah. 
that's a, that's an amazing question uh and i've never been asked that so right. that's 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 i've done a few of these and that i've never been asked so i really really like that um but really man the the relationship with the saxophone is i've i'm not a huge huge gearhead right so what i get and what i always think about is what do i have equipment wise that's going to make me sound the most like the sound of the saxophone that I hear in my head. Yeah. Whatever gets me closest to the ideal sound that I hear in my head, I'm going to go with that. And I found that sound and I've liked that sound since it's been now, I want to say about 10 or 11 years since I got the sound and I've been using the same gear ever since. I have not changed because it's the sound that I hear in my head. And, and you mentioned about everyone has, you know, kind of like their gift and what they use to channel that and communicate. And I personally believe that I've always had a way of always seeing music with words and speech and how they kind of are interconnected. And I'm a huge fan of communication and discussion and dialogue. And that's my thing. And I think that's my gift. I believe that is my gift. And my passion is this music. And I'm able to express myself freely because words get you in trouble sometimes but <laughs> when i put the things i need to say on the horn i can say what i want yeah. and it's okay we're supposed to be in the land of the free and freedom of speech but we all know sometimes it's not fully true but when i speak in my music you know i get that so mainly as long as i get the sound that i'm hearing up here um that's really the main thing for me man like just getting that sound out and that relationship is tough it's a day-to-day -to -day fight not gonna lie to you some days <laughs> the saxophone is forgiving and she says all right i'm gonna give you what you want and then <laughs> some days oh man some days you know you gotta put in some time and fight with her and you know just go it's it's i always say it's the longest standing relationship i've ever had there's good days there's bad days but at the end of the day i know whatever the day is like it's worth it to still be in the relationship and i'm not going anywhere so see, that's see, how we are this is why we're going to be tight because i've described the podcast experience in the same way of it, it very similarly <laughs> like this is my longest relationship and it's the ups the, the downs the sort of all right i want to take a break for a little bit all right i'm back baby you know here we go <laughs> <laughs> let me whisper yeah. to your ear you know <laughs> yeah yeah you're not going nowhere yeah <laughs> So, so I, from this, this, this viewpoint, like, you know, as I, you know, was touching on earlier, you know, having sort of this l less connected, um, relationship with the music, the, the sort of culture will have, because I think a lot of times it's, it's bigger than just, you know, some songs that it, it's not disposable jazz isn't disposable, I believe. And I, I think it's bigger. I think it's culturally oriented. And so, you know, being around it and seeing it, how, has like you know jazz and, and being a part of your life like shaped your identity as you've you know grown from a, a teenager into a man you know that's that's a thing and you know do you say cat a lot you know do you like yeah these cats <laughs> you know, like, what are you <laughs> yeah man there's always there's there's something very like the jazz community you know or you call it black american music community is like it's a very storytelling community like, I think we, our whole culture is built around storytelling. Like, you know, cats will come to the gig, but then at the end of the gig, they'll take, you You know, cats are hanging until who knows when, just talking about stuff that happened on the tour and on a gig and having done this and having done that. And that's just a big, 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 big thing around the culture. And I think it shaped me in such a huge way because jazz uh, has, it taught me so many lessons early. You know, um, playing the role of a saxophonist, meaning being a front man or being a person on what we call the front line. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have to be able to create opportunities for other people. I also have to be able to lead a band. I also have to be able to pay people <laughs> because what makes you a good band leader is your ability to provide for people, um, but also understanding what it means to be a leader, but also to be balanced um, and to also be empathetic. And what's beautiful is in all music, there is 
you know, soloing and stuff and improvisation, but jazz is the only one where it's literally collective improvisation. So yeah. where I'm saying something and the piano saying something back, and maybe I don't even have something to say right now, but the piano plays a chord and plays a thing or a rhythm that I can latch onto, and it gives me a new story to tell or it adds to whatever I was missing. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, it also taught me a load of empathy, like how to be a soloist. And I'm saying something that is very important because sure, I'm saying it, but while I'm saying it, I still have my ears open to hear what the pianist has to say and to hear what the drummer has to say and what the bass player has to say. And that creates the whole atmosphere of this beautiful magic moments in the music. And I take that stuff with my whole life, man. Like being empathetic to family members, to friends. And even if I have an idea, you know what I'm saying? Working collectively with people, jazz has taught me that. That culture has brought me a long, long, long way in my professional life, personal life, music life, you name it. So big, big effect on me in that sense. That that is that is great. And you know, I think when you're putting time towards something and it becomes like it's it's your thing, you know, it's yeah big part of the life or what have you and in, in doing this, this is collaborative, right? And, you know, four plus years doing it, been a podcast for about 15 years, it takes patience, it takes collaborative thing. And, you know, going into it, you know, there's a sort of, um, it, it's it's sort of a, uh, a gentleman's agreement or a gentle person's agreement <laughs> where, you know, I'm going to be prepared and the guest is going to be prepared and we're going to have a dialogue, we're going to have a conversation. And, you know, kind of how that goes is how that goes. There's a certain degree of improvisation that comes in here, but there's some structure. We know that we're meeting at this time. There are going to be questions asked. And sometimes it's, you know, I'll have like sort of a, a framework and it's like, all right, let's deviate a little bit. Let's get a little deeper into the weeds. And going back to one of the things you touched on, I want to comment on it. I, I, I look at, you know, the the scene, right? And, and being around in different communities, I look at it very similarly as being around comedians for some reason. I don't know. It's like, mm. you know, they, they talk about their different shows and it's the nightlife component and you got to be able to control an audience and usually intimate settings. And I, I, I don't know, I was recently in, in the front of a group or hanging out with a group of um, comedians and he thought I was one of them. I'm like, I'm a fan. I'm just a <laughs> dude that, that's here. But then they're like, no, you should start doing this, though. And in mm -hmm. some of the conversations I've had with performers and musicians that are in sort of the jazz scene, it's like, so you're around or right? you're like a jazz journalist, right? And it's like, nah, I'm just just a dude. <laughs> <laughs> you're just a dude that's paying attention. That's what you yeah. And um, so I, I must ask, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask this. So you're you're in Miami. You said you were splitting time between Miami, you know, Atlanta and, you know, NYC. So what's the Miami jazz scene like? Because I am ignorant to that. I, I know sort of this northeast, obviously, New Orleans, but in maybe we go out west. I, I don't know. But I, don't, I never heard of like the, new, the the Miami jazz scene. So tell me a little bit about that. So Miami is why you don't hear about it too too much is because of also like we we're almost like not even the south you know we south south but i don't i don't really i don't really know if we're south i was doing a, a workshop the other day and it was described as more like we're north caribbean mm -hmm. like <laughs> we're more north caribbean than we are south and um so our whole thing is kind of different where the scene is filled with a lot of the music of the culture. So you find salsa bands playing here, playing Hispanic music. Um, there's a lot of Cuban music, you know, a lot of Venezuelan music, Peruvian music. You'll hear like that kind of stuff around. And there's a lot of these cultures here as well. So with those things, and if we're talking about now the jazz scene, there's a lot of fusion. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff into the jazz culture. Now the straight ahead jazz scene is pretty small and it's kind of now being kind of spearheaded mainly by the college kind of scene. Cause you know, we do have the University of Miami down here where they have a very, very strong jazz program. Um, but one of the things that I can say about the scene is, um, you know, there is a lot of very promising young eager killing cats playing out here man it's 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 heavy there's some guys with some real talent and you can go and hear music but it's not as mainstream sure. you know 
like it's like one of those things where like you got to know you know and you got to be looking for it to find it you know Uh, because a lot of the venues that we knew and loved that were featuring jazz and giving us a platform and a stage to not only just play but to play and get paid the, the, the pandemic kind of took those places out, you know, sadly. So yeah. there are still a few places that you can find music. But I will say, man, sad, the the kind of downfall is that it's it's very rare that you find a Black group playing this music. Mm. And this is Black American music at its core. It is essentially that is what jazz music is. And, you know, that's kind of... The only thing that's kind of lacking or missing sure. um and i wish more of our people down here and that's what i do now i giving it to my community and and speaking to the youth of my community and going out and playing for my community letting them know that this thing is possible and i have a, a band full of caribbean brothers and we all play and we take the music very seriously the history very seriously all while taking our history and our culture seriously as well and we're just pushing it to the younger groups man because i would love to see everyone get involved you know not just the college but like to see everyone being able to hear this music man you know so but it's a good scene man it, it's it's driving it's growing for sure growing. that's that's, that's um, great to hear and, I, and, I, and i'm definitely going to go back on that. i got a comment on this this one thing and this is what i was touching on when i mentioned um i think either before we started or early on the sunny rollins thing was in that trace that chasing train documentary and, mm-hmm. and one of the things I remember in that documentary is a lot of folks, and it's it's not it's it's more of a observation than anything else. It's a lot of folks that look like me and you that are the documentarians around it. And I, I think you know folks that look like me and you need to kind of take that sort of you know in in a in a bigger, better way across various spectrums, whether it be from a journalistic standpoint or you know just in a big, bad way in supporting it. But like this is your birthright. This is your thing. You know, this is this is yours having an interest in it and really being able to take it to that next level. But it is great to to hear that you're 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 taking it very seriously, obviously, but also working to give it back and do some of that work. Um, You know, I see the, the education component there. And as a person that is. Now I can say I'm an educator as well in podcasting, <laughs> which is a recent development uh, and trying to, you know, give it to sort of that that next generation. Tell me about the decision to go into that and some of the other maybe non-music oriented, but maybe music instructor, maybe ambassador to it sort of roles that you've taken on, you know, at this stage in your your journey. Well, I, I just always had in my head, you know, um, no matter, it's kind of something my, my father always instilled in me too. It's like, no matter what it is that you have, um, you should be able to share it. So if you got knowledge, you got you got any game, you can put someone on, and put them on to it. If you love them, you share it with them. And I just knew early on, man, like I, I remember started teaching. I started giving my first lessons when I was 16, uh, like 15, 16 years old. I didn't know so much about the saxophone, but I knew I knew something. And I knew there was people that didn't know that something that I had, no matter how little it was. So I was like, I want to teach it to someone, whoever will take it. And at first I started giving lessons for free. I was like, I just want to teach people stuff. And I started and I loved it. And then one of my friends was like, man, you should charge for these lessons. You know, these are like, how much are you charging? And I'm like, I could, I could charge for this. Like what? Okay, sure. So then I started charging for lessons and doing lessons. And then early on I started teaching and, going to different schools, teaching about, you know, more of the style, because I've studied deeply the style and like how to, you know, do different articulations and how you're actually supposed to like, you know, actually articulate the music. And this is kind of like a style clinician, style technician thing that I've done in a lot of different schools. And I was kind of everywhere for some time. Um, And then I kind of went into uh, working with the Miami Music Project. And that is where I started really working with the community of Little Haiti, which is where I grew up. And that was was just huge for me, man. Like just giving back to my community in that way was so refreshing. And, and now I'm currently the jazz director at the Miami Arts Charter School. And now I'm teaching like, you know, kids that 
really, really are serious about this and want to do this. And they audition to come in and they're like really serious about the music. And it's just fun to be able to teach them because I also went there. So <laughs> it's like, yeah, so be it, to be able to teach at my alma mater is it's it's beyond a blessing and 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 I love it so much. Um, and of course, it has grown into a wider scale outside of my own community, um, where now I'm as ambassador um, with the U.S. Department of State, and wherever they send me, I go. <laughs> and it's all about creating that energy and allowing the music to bring. Uh, whatever culture it is, whatever the language is, whatever the social status is, but none of that really matters. And in all the places that I've gone and worked with and all the embassies I've worked with, that's never an issue. When it comes down to the music, we come together regardless of whatever the background, whatever the situation is. And to be able to teach in these many places and to meet a bunch of people and just to be able to touch these lives with, with the music, it's been invaluable, man. So I... I'm just blessed to do that work. It's wonderful. And in talking about the the ambassador role, where, it, it, you know, I always look at sort of, you know, when I do this, like um, I do interviews, I think about when I have a really cool experience, a really cool interview, you know, something for me, like maybe getting a press pass to go to an event or be a, an invited mm -hmm. speaker. To, it's like, oh, someone's like podcasting brought me this. You know, being a yeah. person that has an interest brought me this. As far as like you know, jazz and your your journey thus far, what what are some of the highlights that you know, jazz and and being a musician and being a, a an educator and being in the roles that you've been in and the spaces you've been in, what have, what has that given you that really like comes top of mind for you? Um. Man, there's so many, so many things <laughs> that have contributed to like just blow my mind. And sometimes I'm just like, what the heck? Um, but one of the one of the one of the biggest ones that comes to mind, I think, is uh my first ever ambassador tour. Um, and they sent us to Mexico. And one of the places in Mexico we went to is a place called Tepito where it's supposedly one of the most dangerous barrios in all of Mexico. And we're talking about, you know, very, very heavy stuff. You know, we pull up and it's like, you know, you see all kinds of stuff, you know, crack pipes and, you know, drug dealers and everything. And it's a real situation. I'm not a stranger to that, you know, environment. You know what I'm saying? So I'm cooling but they're like you know we got to be real careful you know and they're telling us oh man there's gonna be you know we're gonna be playing to prisoners and we're gonna be talking to them about this and they're gonna bring them in on this and that. i'm like okay and i'm ready for this and i'm there like i'm like all right let's get it going you know they're taking us down armored trucks we've got people i'm like okay this is real man two buses pull up and we're up there just ready we're like all right here we go and a two bus loads full of children, man. Like children, like all of the most just hungry, amazing kids, man. They come off of this bus. I'm like, where are the prisoners at, man? You know, like where they at? Like, and some did come actually, like some of the people from around the way. And it was a beautiful situation to have some of the kids that, and some of those kids were so serious about jazz and learning the music. Like we had some of them come up and play with us and we taught them some tunes and we played with them. And then we had some, you know, some of the guys that were from the area that were a part of the master class came, they rapped, they freestyled with us and, you know, over like C Jam Blues. So we're swinging and they're, they're rapping in Spanish. And it was like mind blowing. Like that was one of those moments. And I was like, oh, and I took a picture with uh, with this young soprano saxophone player and all the saxophone ki like kids, and they were just so loving and happy to see me, and I was happy to see them. We ain't we ain't know nothing. We saying to each other, <laughs> you know. I had a translator there, so she was helping me out. But that was one of the most beautiful moments. And literally the next day, we end up opening up for Nora Jones at the Riviera Maya Jazz Festival. Wow. And I'm there backstage next to Nora and seeing Bobby McFerrin backstage with his legs crossed, just watching his play. And it's like, whoa, like it was one of those moments where I stopped and I was like, what is going on right now? <laughs> like, what is going on? Because I remember, you know, going to Miami Arts and going 
going home and just the neighborhood I had to get through to get to my house and having to walk and, you know, even getting, getting, you know, I got jumped before yeah. for doing that, being the odd man out and, you know, everything I had to go through to practice. My parents not wanting me to practice. So I'm going in my brother's car and practicing late night, just trying to get some hours in and, you know, like doing all kinds of stuff, man. And, and to have it come down to that. And I'm like, man i'm getting to have these moments and that time looking for north it was twenty three thousand people in attendance and i'm sitting there like i can't believe this is happening and where i started to where i'm at i'm just blessed and just grateful man like that's that's it those that that's it that's like yeah yeah that's a, <laughs> that's, that's a beautiful trajectory right there um yeah that's 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 wonderful so I got I got one more sort of real question, um, and I, I kind of want to leave it a little bit open ended in terms of uh, talking about um, you know sort of it's it's been five years since your your debut album right uh, progressions right or progression has it been that long I see two thousand eighteen <laughs> oh okay it feels that way long because I was writing since like fourteen so I, that makes sense twenty eighteen yeah so yeah. so. You know, talk about sort of the growth there, and I believe I, I see the CL experience. So, 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 tell us about that for those who are undipped, because I'm partially dip. You know, like when when someone is taking their chip, right, and you put it in like salsa, <laughs> it's like I'm partially coated, but I don't have enough flavor <laughs> on me yet. So, tell me you're properly flavored, sir. Does that work? Oh, <laughs> oh my God, man. Um... <laughs> what a man what a journey it's interesting because whenever people bring up progression i'm like oh my god like that record did happen like that record happened and i put that out on some like i'm gonna just be fearless you know let's get something out we got to get some music out and the growth has been exponential and what happened with progression was i was on the scene and i was hungry you know, I was outside. I didn't have a set band at the moment. At that time, I only had had the CL Trio that I was working on stuff with, cooking stuff up with. But I really wanted to do an album with the players that I looked up to the most in the scene. So I have cats like, you know, David Shiverton on drums, Tal Cohen on keys, Dion Keith Kerr on bass. You know, these guys that I like really looked up to and was like, I really want to play with them. You know, Arvel Nakundi. And these guys came through, I gave them my music and we we played it. We had a studio session one day and we we went through the music and boom, what happened, happened. We did it at the Sound and Engineering Institute here. I had one of my homies there. He mixed it, he mastered it for me. I didn't know a dang thing about mixing or mastering or production. I heard it, I was like, oh snap, there's music that is recorded. Let's put it out. <laughs> and, and, I was ecstatic about this. And there was some really deep stuff on there, though. There's some deep material on there. And I love it. When I listen to it sonically, I say, wow, OK, that is a clear picture of where I was. Yeah. Now, years down the line, CL Trio was cooking behind, behind closed doors. CL Quartet started coming out. And then the CL experience really happened and took off in 2000. I want to say 17 was when I found a group of guys that I had been playing with for a while and guys that I've known for 10 years plus we were in college together all that and we got together and I said guys I've written some music for us and let's get together and make it happen and now we're working on influences which is this next album and what's so different about this one is now I've done enough studio work and I've done, I've done so many different things now that like I have such a clear view of what I really want and need to hear sonically. Yeah. Um, so this it's a whole different sound. Like when you hear both of them, it's like, oh, oh, okay, this sounds like a record from like the 50s, even though it was in 2018. And now this one sounds a little more modern. Um, and I just dug into all the things that I was hearing and my influences and I wasn't being apologetic about anything and I wasn't making any music in any way to please anyone or to make anyone validate anything. I said, I wanna play this music and these are the songs that I'm hearing. And this is what I wanna do. And I got my brothers on my side doing it with me, the CL experience and man, it's different because we've been recording this album now for about three years. 
as opposed to one studio session we've been recording for about three or four years now and it's been a journey because we've toured the music already even though it's not out yet <laughs> you know we've toured it because yeah. we want to see how it affects people first and we've grown into the music as a collective which is completely different from me picking guys that i really look up to come into a session we knock it out here it's been like we've been living with the music for years and growing and making it into something and that's what we recorded so what you guys are hearing currently with our singles and our releases and what you're gonna hear in the full album it's gonna be a completely different level i think because it's a lot deeper the connection with the music with the music the musicians and the time we put into it it's one can say it's a uh, progression creatively mm. <laughs> Mm. But, but also also real quick mm. <laughs> it is that that thing I, I think the and maybe i'm gonna pat myself on the back for this but sort of the salient thing of you know the the musician specifically the jazz musician and comedian sort of comparison i was getting that earlier when a comedian is going out they're working on new material they're 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 torn with it you know and they're they're living with it and, and tweaking as they go along and when because I'm, I'm a big stand-up guy so when i get that new release i'm like okay they did that in front of someone but how many times have they done it you know how many times have they tweaked that that sort of bit and you know that's 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 dope and it's great to hear sort of you know being able to see like hey i was hungry i got this out there and i did this and giving it its due but also it's like, man, where I'm at now, boy, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, I look at this, the same thing in doing this, like, you know, you know, some of the questions I've asked you in this, this interview, I wouldn't have the skill or even the thinking to ask someone that then it was the, you know, you know, when I started the sort of imposter thing of how can you ask somebody creative anything? It's like, you ain't nobody. You just podcast it. But now it's just like, yo, I'm curious. Tell me about this, bro. <laughs> Yeah, and that and that's where it's at. I mean, the growth, I don't know from before as much, but the growth, that's the key right there. Because the questions you're asking me, I'm like, this is different. So yeah, man, I'm gonna pat you on the back too, man. I, I, this is this is great. <laughs> so so with that, unfortunately, we'll be wrapping up now. <laughs> Whoa, all right. We're, we're, we're getting to the, the sort of Time rapid flies fire. when you're having fun, I guess. 100. <laughs> So I want to go into the rapid fire portion and I have added another one um, just as a nice sort of closeout. But I have I have five of them and um, I want to start off and, and, and just to give you the preface, don't overthink them. You know, they're, you know, okay. whatever they are is what they are. Um, go against my nature. Completely same. got it. Same as gotcha. an Aquarius. I'm going to overthink everything. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the All first right. one. Um, okay. Your day generally starts with which of the following? Coffee, tea, or something else? Tea. Okay. Any particular type? Um, I'm drinking lemon ginger right now as we speak, and okay. I woke up this morning and also had lemon ginger. I believe I have some elderberry lemon balm tea in here, but I've been drinking a lot of green tea recently. All right. Tea's fire. I'm with that. Here's the next one, because I'm because uh, th this podcast has a a regional and a cultural component. So I'm curious, what is your favorite Miami landmark? It doesn't have to be something that's famous and big, but something that's like you know kind of favorite for you. Wow, don't overthink it. Don't overthink it. Okay, favorite Miami landmark. Man, this is hard. <laughs> There's so many things. Um. I guess one of the things that came to my mind immediately is that's still standing, I guess, would be Churchill's um, Churchill's pub, which is like right in the center of Little Haiti. And it's just this really like it's it's different from all the other buildings and you can kind of see it. And there was always great live music there. And it's been a landmark forever. And it's it was home for so many jazz musicians and just I don't know. And even when I was a kid, before I knew there was music happening there, I always noticed Churchill. So I was like, I was living right down the block from it. So every time I would walk home, skate home, whatever, I was like, oh, Churchill's. <laughs> Until I even knew what was happening inside, it was like, oh, Churchill's. So yeah, yeah Churchill's pub. That's That was a huge Miami landmark, but it's actually shut down now, sadly. But uh, yeah. Building yeah. still stands. And the, the name of the building is still there. So churches. 
it is one of those things when you're younger and you're like, I wonder what happens there when you become older. Oh, that's what happens there. Got yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So uh, that mark for me at least. Yeah. Oh. What was the last book you read? Man, 12 week year. Okay. The 12 week year. I'm actually currently almost done with it, actually. Um, but last book I completed, you want to know? Sure. <laughs> Never split the difference, Chris Voss. So I have, that I have was the, the last audio book. I yeah. I'm so an audio book guy. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> when it, when yeah, it comes man. to. When, when I it, like to take the notes. I, no, nah, I hear you. I hear you. Um, I, th- I I have like the, the the thing where you can ping certain parts of it, and it's like I need mm, to get on that one. I need to put nice, the tab nice. there. Because uh, nice. I'm also very curious about food. Um, so I don't know anything about Haitian food. So see, I, I saw I saw your face, your expression change. So all right, I right, if I'm going to a place, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What is the one thing that I have to get if I'm trying Haitian food for the first time? What's the one thing that I have to get that um, is a nice entree into uh, Haitian food? As a turn of phrase, Guyo. Guyo. G R I O T. Guyo. It's like a fried pork, and you get it with rice and beans, and with fried plantain, and you make sure you get extra this thing called piclis. Piclis yeah. is like this spicy kind of sauce that we use almost like a spicy slaw it's really really good so you make sure you get a grill and most places you go you just say grill complete they know what you mean which means okay. a complete grill that comes with rice and peas a fried plantain and the pickles now you get deep you get after that the, the the haitian dish i can't live without i need in my life always is a dish called legume legume and that's l-e-g-u-m-e-s and it's this vegetable stew sometimes it's made with oxtail sometimes it's made with pork man listen to me (laughs) man the legume you have it with white rice and black beans listen to me listen to me (laughs) listen to me my brother let me know how that go for you you can start with the grill and then have you some legume and let me know we're, we're doing advanced Haitian food. That's what we're doing right now. And advanced, it gets deeper than that. I'm just, I'm going to keep it surface okay. for right now. You know what I'm saying? But that's, that's the stuff. That's I'll, the I'll, be stuff. I'll be reporting back. I'll be reporting back. For real though, for real. Please let me know. 100%. Uh, so, so this is sort of the, the, the last uh, question is more of an entry into the, the, the sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, shameless plugs portion of the pod. Cause you know, I like to, you know, pay it forward where folks can talk about what they have coming up in their world. So, you know, I will invite you there. What is next for you? Upcoming projects, performances, things of that nature. Um, you know, that let us know what, what we can look forward to in the next, like, you know, few months. Well, in the next few months, uh, we are working on completing the album. There is new music coming out this month as well. We've been rolling out the album in singles in a way, and the full length album will be out soon, <laughs> very soon. Um, and that you can look out for at the end of the year, Q4. We're going to try to get that out for you guys. Um, also, we are going to be touring in 2024. Um, the goal is to go back to Europe. So for all of my you know, friends in the Baltics and Eastern Europe and all across there that have rocked with us and our music, we will come back. Um, we are working on an East Coast tour as well, going on the Chitlin circuit. So yeah, we, we trying to get it in, you know, um, in the East Coast once that drops. Um, and there's a lot more that I can't actually talk about yet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not I'm not that. allowed to speak <laughs> on, but, um, yeah, I, I'm just really, I think what I'm really excited about is bringing influences to everybody, man, bringing you guys that, that piece of work, that album. I, I just can't wait for y'all to have the whole thing. And that's coming very, very soon. That's going to be so great. I'm looking forward. I, I'll be watching those tour dates for City Near Me, as it were. And uh, and yeah, sure. definitely we got to connect on that. Um, so 
that's pretty much it. Um, so in these final moments, I want to invite and encourage you to let the folks know where they can find out all of the information pertinent to Claudence Louis. Let us know where can they find everything? All right. So I'm very, very active on uh, the socials, mainly Instagram is where you can find a lot of information, especially regarding singles that are being released, where I'm performing in Miami, outside of Miami, on tour myself or with other artists or with the CL Experience. Y'all can check us out at Claude and Sack. So that's at C-L-A-U-D-E-N-S-A-X. So Claude and Sax on uh, Instagram and Facebook and all that, whatever. And if you want to hear our music that is out right now and hear those singles that we got popping from the Influences album and when the album comes out, you want to look us up at The CL Experience on all listening platforms, including YouTube. And that is The C-I-E-L and then Experience, E-X-P-R-I-E-N-C-E. So yeah, that's us. And also we have The CL Experience Dot com where you can also get linked up to the whole discography and see our events and see what's happening so you get tapped in with us there too. And there you have it, folks. I want to again thank Claudence Lewis for coming on to the podcast and sharing a bit of its journey with us. And for Claudence Lewis, I am Rob Lee saying that there's art, culture, and community in and around your neck of the woods. You've just got to look for it. Mm-hmm.